And then distemper in um, parvo vaccine in dogs and distemper in cats uh, is another very important vaccine. Those, it's, those vaccines um, protect against a battery of common diseases that we have in the area that are expensive and really terrible and, and be deadly. deadly, you know, yeah. as we see um, heartbreaking cases where animals are hospitalized for extended stays and they're very sick and sometimes die and it's, it's very preventable. They have their puppy and kitten series once a month until they're four months of age and then um, every third year after that, that's what we recommend, not more often than every third year. Um, and then there are, there are other vaccines outside cats. We talk about leukemia vaccines if they have exposure to unvaccinated cats. Um, leukemia is more likely to happen in young animals, but we you know tailor it to the individual if they if they should continue to get leukemia vaccinated. Right. And then there's Bordetella vaccine. It's just a, a intranasal or it can be given injectively for dogs that are boarding often or um, go to the groomer. It helps to protect against some colds that go around when a lot of animals are together. Lyme vaccine we talk about and um, lepto. Lepto is a bacteria that can be found in contaminated water sources. That's another, the reason that's a big topic is because it also can be zoonotic. People can get uh -huh. lepto. Um, it used to be part of the core vaccine, but because it's a little more apt to cause allergic reactions in some dogs, dachshunds, little white dogs, um, it's been taken out of the, of the um, distemper combo. Yep. So we, again, tailor that to the individual. If the dog has, lives on a farm or hikes a lot or has a lot of exposure to ponds and you know, streams and puddles, then those dogs should probably get a yearly lepto vaccine. And again, that vaccine is a, is a pretty good vaccine. It vaccinates for some strains of lepto, not all strains. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a good idea to, to maintain that if, if it's right for that animal. And from the sheltering uh, standpoint too, is that, uh, you know, parvovirus, which mm -hmm. I think is now maybe yeah. 15 to 20 years or more older, yeah. old. Um, you know, we used to see that quite a bit, especially when we used to handle a lot of puppies within mm -hmm. the shelter. And uh, we've recently seen some. It's, it we is in too. the area, so, yeah. um, and also distemper in cats. So for us, yeah. if the animal's coming in, the more and more people that have to surrender, for whatever yeah. reason, they're vaccinated, it actually helps us and keeps our shelter environment Healthy. safe as well. Yeah. I know my dog's about to go through this, <laughs> but uh, dentistries. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's become, and even within the sh within the shelter, Dr. Looney, is that so many cats are coming in, and we're able to keep cats that are much older today right. than they used to be. Right. Um, and so it's not uncommon for us to have a cat 10, 11, 12, 13 years of age, yeah. even a little bit more, available for adoption. Almost everyone needs a dentistry. Right. What can we do to help, yeah. help keep um, that down? Good oral care is so important because not only does it affect their quality of life, I mean, you can imagine to have chronic dental pain affects their ability to eat, affects their how they feel, their mobility. Um, often if you have an animal that has severe dental disease and you take care of their teeth, we get feedback from the clients, gosh, they act like a puppy or a kitten. I had no idea that they were yeah. not feeling well because look at them now, they move around, they're more affectionate, they eat better. So um, animals are, are amazingly stoic sometimes about dental disease that it's, it's hard for owners to know if it really is bothering them. So um, it, it is very important to maintain their, their oral health. Things that we can do is recommend um, hard things to chew on. So for cats, hard food and yeah. um, their dental treats out there if they can get them to chew on them and brushing their teeth daily. I know that's a lot to ask, but yeah, if people but can, it, yeah. it does help if people can do it. Um, you can start slow, just a piece of gauze and work up to a, a soft toothbrush with um, toothpaste that's designed for dogs and cats. It tastes good and it has enzymes in there to help break down some of the um, plaque that's forming. In dogs, um, chewing can be of great help in keeping their mouth healthy. If we can get dogs, I always recommend rawhides. I know that can be a, a debatable topic depending mm -hmm. on if the animal can tolerate it. But when I see old dogs come in that have puppy teeth, beautiful teeth, I always ask, what are you doing at home? And 99% of the time people say, oh, he gets rawhides all the time. Yep. Rawhides are soft enough that they don't break teeth, like real bones can, nyla bones can, but they're hard enough that they scrub the teeth and they exercise the gums and they really keep their teeth clean. And it's normal to see a little bit of blood on the rawhide because especially when they first starting, start chewing, right. it will cause the gums to bleed a little bit. 
but I recommend just a supervised 10, 15 minutes a night chewing of rawhide and take it away, take put, it it, away. put it up, but every night if they can chew on rawhide for 10, 15 minutes, if the piece gets small, throw it away so they don't swallow a big hunk of it and choke on it. I think that can do a lot to, to help maintain their mouth, healthy mouth. And if they do develop dental infection or abscessed teeth or broken teeth, then I recommend a dental, uh, which right. does require anesthesia. So we try to avoid that if we can. But sometimes it's important to pull any abscessed teeth or, you know, sometimes if they have a little lump in their mouth, we might biopsy it or remove it at that same time. Okay. So. The, um, another issue that I'm sure you see quite a bit of these days, too, is obesity. Yeah. In, in canine, I, my guess is maybe even more in felines and canines, and I'm just yeah. guessing there, but yeah. um, that's got to become an issue, yeah. and there's some health risk associated with yeah. that as well, correct? Right. It is a little bit more prevalent in cats, but dogs as well. Um, I was looking at the um, the national average is somewhere between 20 and 40 percent um, of animals are either overweight or obese, um, and there are. Um, studies that show obesity does shorten the length of life and it shortens their quality of life because they are prone to certain health conditions when they are obese. Um, they are prone to diabetes um, and cats more so than dogs we see um, with diabetes. They do end up requiring um, twice a day, sometimes once a day, insulin injections if they are a diabetic. Um, they are prone to having mobility issues. They can't get around as well. They have more arthritis. They can't they, clean themselves. They can't groom well, yeah. so they end up with mats or just dirty coats. That um, So it's more work for the owners to have to try to maintain their coats. Um, heart and um, breathing issues, some of these small dogs with you know pushed in faces and small airways like pugs and things like that. So my guess is there's diets that are out there to yep. help. Yep. Um, if you have a senior animal or animal that's a little bit less active or just has put on a little bit of weight, it's important to really quantitate how much you're feeding them because often people don't realize just how much they're getting. So knowing how much you're feeding them and then after your visit, talk about exactly how much they should get and low fat foods, um, smaller quantities, more frequent because that'll help keep their metabolism up. So maybe two, not one big meal a day, but two small meals a day. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Yes. exercise. Yep, yep. I do have to ask you this, you know, it's, this is the Berkshire Humane Society's cable TV show, Spaying and Neutering, the yeah. importance of it. I'm all for I saved it to the end. Thank you. It's so important. <laughs> There, are, you probably know. I mean, there's in the millions of animals that uh, pet overpopulation is the is the main reason for spaying and neutering animals. If, is it in the tens of millions now nationwide? I mean, it's there's the numbers do vary, yeah. but there are some people say up to where in, within the United States between 14 and 50 million animals get surrendered to yeah. shelters every yeah. single year. And so many of them are healthy animals that are just unwanted because right. there's not enough homes. So that's by far the biggest issue is pet overpopulation. But there are also um, health benefits to spaying and neutering animals. Uh, females that are spayed before they go into their first heat are less prone to mammary cancer. Um, unspayed females are prone to pyometra, which is an infected uterus that will be fatal if it's not treated and it ends up being an expensive right. surgery later on in life that could have been prevented. Um, males can have more prostatic disease than if they were neutered. There's behavioral issues oh, come in. Lots of behavioral yeah. issues that get cut out by having yeah. your... Urine marking and yeah. aggression and wandering. We see more hit by cars with animals that are going off looking for a girlfriend yep. that could have been prevented. Yep. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. You went by so quick. I know. Thank you for um, having me. But uh, thank you, Dr. Looney. And uh, we'll be right back in a moment. We're going to show you a few animals that you have available for adoption today at Per Wag Adapt.
Welcome back, and today we have Lindsay's back visiting us with our canine companion of the week. And who do we have with us today, Lindsay? This is Brooks. He's our five-year-old um, neutered male standard poodle. Um, he got surrendered to us because he was too much for the elderly owner in the house. He definitely, you know, is even though he's five, he's still young, likes to jump. You know, he's definitely a very powerful dog, even though he is a poodle. Um, so, but he's a, lot a very of good boy. grooming involved with a standard poodle. Oh yes, you know, they're definitely not your easygoing maintenance dogs. Um, you know, they do have hair, so they do grow constantly. So, you know, every six to eight weeks, you're definitely going to need, you know, proper grooming. Okay. And daily brushing. <laughs> so you're looking specifically for a home with him with someone that's home during a day where if his housebreaking to cure his housebreaking issues or? Yes, you know, someone that's going to be, you know, constantly on top of him. You know, someone that's not going to let him get away with things. You know, he's definitely going to need an owner that, you know, is constant, you know, having him sit for everything. You know, in his previous home, he kind of got away with everything. We had to reteach him everything. You know, just the basic sick command he didn't even know. So. I noticed before, you know, because I remember when he first came in, he didn't know many or any commands at all. And just seeing him sit there for a treat was, was quite impressive. So. Yeah, he finally, you know, sit and he's starting to learn down with a lure. Yeah. So he's how come long, a long way. How long has he been at the shelter? He's actually surprisingly been at the shelter for, you know, almost two months now. You know, with a standard poodle, we haven't seen them at all, at least since right. four years since I've been there. So, you know, it's definitely very weird to see him here this long. But, you know, like I said, he's not your typical standard poodle that people see, so. Okay, could you, uh, <laughs> how, anybody's interested in, in Brooks here or any of the other canines that they may see during our break, uh, mm -hmm. how do they get a hold of you? Um, all they have to do is just call the shelter. It's 413-447-7878 and extension 26 goes right to our kennel office. All right, well, Lindsay, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for having and, us. Um, and <laughs> we'll, we'll see you next show. Yes, sounds good. Thank you. We're gonna take one more quick break and we'll be right back. Welcome back, and we want to thank everybody this week for watching Per Wagged Up, Berkshire Humane Society's local cable TV access show, and I want to thank all the volunteers behind the scenes that made this show possible, and this week we also want to thank Dr. Michelle Looney from Pittsfield Veterinary Hospital to, uh, for taking the time to talk to us about wellness exams, and uh, one quick more announcement is that we want to remember, if anybody wants to see a specific topic or subject out there, to please give us a call at the shelter. We're located at 214 Barker Road in Pittsfield. Our adoption hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 10 to 4, Thursday evenings, 5 to 8 p.m., and Sundays from 1 to 4 p.m. And don't forget, now we have our feline adoption location uh, down at 301 Stockbridge Road in Great Barrington. It's called Paradise. We have many felines available for adoption. So until our next show, thanks for watching, and tune, again, tune us in again. Thank you. Mm -hmm.